Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Dropping the Hammer with Daniel McFadden. I'm Daniel McFadden. Yeah, I'm Daniel McFadden, and with me is my co-host, co- uh, my uh, podcast co-host, uh, James Crow. Say hi, Crow. Hello, everybody. All right, and with us today on a very special episode of Dropping the Hammer uh, is a friend of mine, someone I've known since the month of May in 2014, uh, Matt Weaver. How's it going, Matt? Dude, I'm, 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 I'm happy that you took time from watching, in between watching the 1996 and 1997 NBNA 400 to do a podcast with me. So this is like a super exciting. I feel oh. super privileged to be able to do this. But I know those those classic races need to be watched and documented, and I yeah. look forward to them. But I, <laughs> I'm appreciative we took time in between. For, for, for the record, I watched the, the it's been like th- three years since i was on those races i'm now i i'm actually i'm up to uh the food city 500 for 1999 that's the next race i gotta watch so i I'm just gonna, i'm gonna interview you for a second how did this start did, was this like a thing that you set out to do that you were going to just start uh. documenting the history of the nascar cup series or did you <laughs> just start watching and it was just like well, ah, okay tweet about it no no well originally i got it in my head like right after Jeff Gordon retired. As someone who, as I grew up not liking Jeff Gordon at all, I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go watch every Jeff Gordon win just so I could see them with my eyes and know that they happened. And then I was like, wait, no, that's no, that, that's a horrible way to do it. I need to watch race by race so I could see all of those wins in context. That, that, that's where, that was the origin. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I did, basically, I just, I, I started, I just watched his first two wins from 94 and then I just skipped ahead to 95 and just went from there. I wish I'd done it the other way. I wish I'd just, you know, started with the 94 or 500. So I could see. I didn't realize there was a trend. So these are all Jeff Gordon races. No, no, no. I mean, no, no, no. I'm watching, I'm watching race by race by race. Okay. Each season. I thought you were. Yeah. 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 So, um, but I wish I'd started with 94 so I could like watch Dale Earnhardt's final championship run. Um, but I didn't, so I just skipped that 95, and I started that in, like, 2016, I think, and I'm up to 1999. Wow. So, um, yeah, uh, and, like, last year, when I got in 1998, I actually, I sprinkled in some Bush Series and Truck Series races, so I could get a flavor of that. That was so. the part that I was most excited for, because I'm actually trying to convince myself to do kind of a similar thing i want to write a story on the final days of the true bush grand national series we're talking like 97 98 99 yeah. the joy barrier fetua um you know dell was in there yeah. but just the prospects of doing a whole season watch is so intimidating to me because i'm, I'm on the road too and i'm doing all yeah. the things that i'm doing and I might need to rely on you because it seems like you've got fresher <laughs> memory of, of those oh, man. era races than I do. Oh, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I didn't watch all of the races, all of the Bush series races. I've watched um, none of them. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I watched a few, but no, like, yeah, ninety seven, like ninety seven, like ah, ninety six through ninety nine. That's really it. You, you had the two Randy LaJoy championships, and then you had Dale Juniors too, and then you get Harvick, you know, in two thousand, and then he goes the cup and then he's dominating he's in the cup but dominating in the bush series in 2001 yeah. and that's really kind of if you don't count mark martin that's what that's what kind of started the bushwhacking i mean stuff. he was doing um bush series and winston west like oh, simultaneously really? but yeah oh, so wow. that was a you know if you ever wanted to chronicle kevin harvick's career his ascension was so rapid because he was running full-time Winston West and Bush series. Mm-hmm. It's like Dale passes and you've got to drive. What was the three? Good job, kid. Good luck. <laughs> but really suddenly yeah. right? he was running short tracks. Yeah. What is now Arca West? Like he was, I mean, he was doing truck series in 96, 97. So, I mean, it's, I mean, he's been around a while. So, and he's still going. So anyway, all right. Uh, we're going to start this off. Like we usually do. Uh, we're going to talk about Atlanta. Um, and, uh, we, we, I mean, Matt, we've had our, our back and forth over the last couple of weeks when it comes to, um, uh, 1.5 mile tracks and the dreaded, uh, 
550 horsepower package. The abomination. Um, and this was the first race where it really showed <laughs> that 550 package for 325 laps. Uh, we we had a, a surpri surprise uh, Ryan Blaney win. Uh, he passed him, passed Kyle Larson with roughly what eight, nine laps to go. Nine. Um, after Kyle Larson um, was spanking the field, um, I was really surprised that it it was anybody but Larson. Um, I mean, at one point he was on on track to possibly put everyone but Blaney a lap down. <laughs> Stupid right. stages. Oh, I love them. Um, so, uh, I guess, Carl, let's, let's start with you. What, what, what was your initial impression of the 325-lap marathon at Lanham Speedway? So, as I've said with every one of these uh, kind of cookie-cutter racetracks, you know, from being a fan in the early 2000s, like, this was my dread of you know, dedicating myself to watching every race this season is uh, all these tracks. Um, but I... Actually, I've always kind of liked the tracks that are very uh, big on tire wear. Um, I, I like when that comes into play more so than fuel strategy. Um, so, and there was a you know decent amount of that, and um, I think tire wear may have been ended up being the deciding factor in the uh, in the in the win. You know, after Larson just just dominated the race like more so than anyone else has this season, only to. Um, fall short about 10 laps um, on traction and lose to Blaney. Well, yeah, uh, I actually watched Radioactive, the Fox Sports thing, uh, just a little while ago, and in it, you hear Ryan Blaney said, I'm going to I'm gonna save tires. And so, you know, with a little less than like 15 to go or whatever, yeah, he starts cutting into Larson's lead, and then all of a sudden, he's there. And um, then he just got around him and ran away. Um, so, which... Uh, this this is Blaney's fifth win, and it's basically it really feels like the first time there wasn't drama related to a Ryan Blaney win. Would you agree, Matt? Yeah, totally. I mean, to go back to the point you were making a second ago, Kyle knew his goose was cooked with twenty to go because I was actually listening to his radio in real time, and you know, seventeen laps to go, he's asking the team how many laps left. Well, seventeen. And then two laps later, they're telling him, you know, don't, don't overdrive the corner like that. And then three more laps pass, and he starts to ask, what line is he running? Because he yeah. wants to take it away, yeah. and he's running the top. And he, he just he can't make the top work. He's committed to the bottom. And that's the point where he runs into the 22, and the 22 knows that he's stuck on the bottom too. So the 22 just ran the bottom. And, <clears> you know, a lot of people – made something of that and I think that's fair game obviously it's a teammate um it's frustrating for the five because as soon as you know Blaney makes the winning pass 22 moves out of the way <laughs> you know that's the sort of thing that that you get for being unable to lap a guy you know, it, mm -hmm. it's up to you the leader to to make that happen and uh the five was unable to because he he cooked the tires I mean you, you saw if you look at the the lap times you, you see that the 12 kind of leveled off in the middle of that run, the final 51 laps. And uh, the five kind of just died to death. The speeds went up and that was the difference. And, you know, that's one thing I do enjoy about Atlanta. We can, we, we can get into this if you want, but oh, yeah, it, no it's time. It's time. Oh, yeah. I love old wore out racetracks, but even with the old package, I think this place had lost its luster uh, 2016, 2017. It was beyond raceable. I would say probably around the time Casey Kane won his race. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah. Right, right, like right after that, I was like, oh, oh boy. A, a victory lane, by the way, I will never ever forget this. This visual is embedded in my head because if you go back and look at the victory lane pictures, the trophy for that race it was the it was the Oral B Dental Care 500. Oh, giant toothbrush was <laughs> the, the giant, giant toothbrush, <laughs> and I was in victory lane for that one. And, Right now, we talk about that race, and in my head, I picture the giant toothbrush and Casey holding it above his head, just looking ridiculous because <laughs> it's the highest level of a, of a motorsport, and you're holding a giant toothbrush. But oh, no, it, it's time. It, it's time. I just hope that we can turn it into something <clears throat> different than what it is now. I, I, I want old old Atlanta back. Yeah, well, uh, I, like, I, I, I feel like I, yeah, I think the chorus for it really grew louder after sunday 
Um, but I've been wanting it for years now because like I remember like as we've talked about, I've been watching old races. So I, I've been watching like two years worth of Atlanta races, freshly replay paved, fresh freshly reconfigured, and those are really, really uh, interesting races to watch from start to finish. And I'm not even up to two, 2000 when we start getting photo finishes. I know the package is different, but for a track to be that newly repaved and to be producing that good of racing that early on is just mind boggling right now. I'm like, can, can we, can we, can we just repave it? Um, so I'm going to say something that's going to sound so sacrilegious coming from me, but if we're committed to NA18D or something similar to it, with you're, the you're, you're, you're gonna, I mean, full, I mean, like, you're gonna have to, like, maybe define some things you say over the course of this, especially well, with, with Crow here. So yeah, I don't even so, know what. So, with the high downforce, low horsepower rules package, that's yeah, okay. NA18D. If we're committed to doing something similar to that for the intermediate tracks next year, and by all accounts, the the new car is being built with that in mind mm -hmm. for the intermediates. I'm actually okay with repaving Atlanta, and I think we've we, we've thought the 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 NA18D rule package kind of wrong. I'm actually okay with it for a place like Las Vegas. I'm okay with it for a place that had fresher pavement, like you know Kentucky. Even though Kentucky was just terrible, no matter what, <laughs> I'm fine with high downforce low horsepower if you were to repave atlanta i think nascar got it wrong in the sense that they did it by track size and then they yeah. know they're wrong too because they keep having to pivot well it was anything over a mile now it's anything over 1.33 miles and yeah i think it really should be by um the age of the track surface because you know, you look at Darlington, one of the reasons they, they've, they've pivoted away from NA18D is they want to be able to run more power, lower downforce on that surface because it's just a better race. Yeah. Uh, Homestead was fun this year. I genuinely enjoyed that race. But the Xfinity race was way better because yeah. of the pavement. I think there's a place for the high downforce, low horsepower. And it's when you quickly, you know, when you have a fresh paved surface because you've got the maximum grip built into that track. You've got very little power, low, um, you've got the high downforce, which gives you even more grip. That's going to allow the cars to stay side by side, produce the kind of racing NASCAR wants to do. But as a track starts to age, that's when you take the downforce off. That's mm -hmm. my compromise. But I, I, I still think NASCAR is committed to doing it by track size. And that's just not it. Yeah. So Crow, Crow to give you some context about like the the – the debate about repaving Atlanta, like four years ago, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. They like had the bulldozers ready. Um, like, yeah, after this weekend, we're, we're going to repave it. Yeah. And then like there, a group of drivers, I don't know who, who let it gotten a NASCAR or not NASCAR's ear. They would have gotten like in the speedway motorsports ear and said, please don't. And they backed off of it. And this is four years ago. And now they've been like... Uh, it was after the 17 race, so 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, it was after 2017. So they, they were getting ready to, and now they've been putting it off for almost five years. The quote that I will never forget was that Kyle Busch said, if they get those bulldozers ready, they're going to have to pave it over my dead body <laughs> because I'm going to lay down right in front of it, which even, even coming from Kyle back then was kind of absurd because... I'm used to surly Kyle. I'm used to abrasive Kyle. This was bombastic Kyle. <laughs> like I, I picture in my head, you know, Kyle Bush laying down in his yellow fire suit as a <laughs> as a paver goes over his body. No, no he no he cha he chains himself to the bulldozer. Yeah, the, the... A, a lot of fans might actually enjoy that. They might pay pay per view for that. But, but I, I I tweeted, you know, during the truck series race Saturday. It's like the, the, the gap between what NASCAR drivers love about racing here and what people get to watch, what we're taking in is vast at Atlanta. There, mm -hmm. There's such a disconnect. And um, it, it was better with the Xfinity race. Um, but 
outside of that, it was like, this is this doesn't translate for us to what, what the driver is. Oh, and and the reason why is this is part of a larger conversation that, that we struggle with as an industry right now. Listen, I, we agree. Atlanta, it needs to be repaved. It's yeah. time under any metric. But I think one of the things that we struggle with as an industry is that the things that drivers say is fun about a place like Atlanta with the bumps and the fact that you can go race against the wall, you can race almost on the apron, how wide the track is. We don't do a good enough job explaining that. And I tweeted about this a couple of days ago, but in this era, NASCAR has tried to convince fans that racing is something that you only see when cars are side by side. Mm -hmm. But in fact, racing is something that you do to the racetrack. You race race conditions you you race the surface you race deltas and yeah. right now um, the current administration is so focused on we got to get cars side by side we've got to get restarts we, we we now have three and a half stages we have the, the 0 0.5 stage because we got to get cars side by side and i don't think we do enough education to let fans know you can have great racing even if cars are separated by five seconds, watch the Delta, watch the lines are running, see where someone gains and loses. You can talk about the engineering. I watched supercars over the weekend and you know, the, the, the Sunday race was not as entertaining as the Saturday race, but I was just so blown away by the broadcast and how they talked about these elements. They talked about the engineering. They talked about um, the tr changing track conditions because it was a wet race mm -hmm. and it's just the kind of thing you don't see on Fox because Fox is a entertainment first and yeah. sport second. There, there were two graphics that they used during the race of Atlanta that I thought that I really enjoyed and really brought a lot of like knowledge and um, like kind of interest into the actual race for me. One was, and they both were the uh, Larson and uh, Blaney pit stops um, related to that. So the first one was just a 2D graphic and it just showed the um like the lap coming in pit stop and then the lap leaving um it was, yeah um to show that differential and then they had a like 3d animation that looked like they pulled it from like nascar heat or whatever that did like an overlay of the two the two cars um mm -hmm. like if they had been at the same point at a certain point on the track and then showed the difference in the pit stops and leaving and i feel like stuff like that um, can go a really long way towards kind of educating people on what you're talking about and um, getting them interested in things beyond the, you know, will they crash? Um, we used to have an entire TV show dedicated to stuff like this. It was, it was called NASCAR Performance, and it was hosted by, you know, just a, a variety of, of hosts. Um, but you would have like a crew chief be the co-host, and they would talk about the technical side of the sport and basically was canceled because Fox concluded uh, that's boring to fans. No one cares about how a race car works. They just want to see them side by side. And I think that's something that is just so, so damning because you, you, you get the fans you cultivate. And I think right now NASCAR and Fox have combined to cultivate a fan that unless it's like Daytona Talladega restarts and crashing, that's not yeah. racing. And that's just sad. That, that's why I, I've always preferred that the second half of uh, the TV schedule. Uh, not, not that I'm biased or anything. Um, I, well, not, not anymore, right? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, 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 I feel free to say what I don't like or like about TV coverage now. But um, I mean, but I think even objectively, um, what, what the presentation in the second half of the season is not boogity, boogity, boogity. They treat so. it more like a sport, and you have that because you have IMSA and, and IndyCar, and they're America's home for motorsports, and I think they take that to heart, and mm -hmm. you're, you're totally right. They, I like the, the team that Fox has, so it has nothing to do with, with Mike, who is like, you know, goat territory. He's one of mm -hmm. the best, period. You know, Jeff brings a lot. I really enjoy Clint. You know, I, I think... 
I think they're trying to emphasize. Hey, did, Matt, did you know that in 2012, Matt, Matt uh, thought, yeah. Boyer, Jeff Gordon had an altercation at Phoenix? Did you know that? Yeah. So listen, <laughs> listen, to, you're right. I, I have heard that might have happened. Um, but now to that point, though, like you have Clint who sometimes, and you hear it, Clint will say, well, I've driven these cars and this is mm -hmm. what it's doing right now. And I'm like, this is so good. Yeah. But then oh, yeah, Fox absolutely. immediately reverts to, ha ha, that Clint Boyer, he's so funny. Tell me a joke. Yeah. And there's room for both. Yeah. There's too much. NASCAR on Fox wants to make me laugh, where NASCAR on NBC wants to make me a smarter race fan. All right. Okay. All right. Let's, so um, through... I guess before we move on, um, how, are you how surprised are you about what Kyle Larson has been able to do through the first six races of the season? Oh no, not at all, not at all. Because you know the knock on Kyle was always, well, he hasn't done it in NASCAR, and yeah, that's, I that's, that's, to that's, myself, that's, I'm gonna ra I'm raising my hand. That's me. Yeah, that's you. That's me. Yeah. yeah. You, you you look at Chip Ganassi Racing and he was limited by his equipment and i always felt like he got more out of that car than could reasonably be expected and listen they've got good people there too i i'm, I'm a big believer in you know for example matt mccall i think what matt mccall and kurt's doing they're punching above their individual weight too because you stick matt mccall and kurt bush in a gibbs or hendrick car their championship serious championship contenders but it's just a limitation of what they have there so you take kyle who is one of the I, I i'm serious when i say this one of the five best race car drivers of any discipline that i've covered he is so good and you stick him in an elite car this is what you get i mean listen i, I know i know a lot of your audience might not follow what he did on the dirt side last year yeah we know he's good in an open wheel car right we yeah. know he's good in a sprint car and a midget <laughs> he, he gets in a late model which is a completely different discipline for the first time and he goes up against the best in the business who in the lucas oil series who are the best who've been doing this 10 15 mm -hmm. years nearly wins second race goes out and wins so he's got all the talent in the world it's just giving him this level of equipment and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of those guys like who will, he's winning. How, how many races did he win? Like on dirt last year, Matt? 54 and 98. Okay. So I'm one of those guys. Okay. Yes. He won 54 races on dirt. Okay. that That's not NASCAR. <laughs> that, that, that's not a cup car. But look at the races he won though. Like we're talking chili bowl we're talking lucas oil we're talking yeah. indiana midget week and these are against high caliber race car drivers i know but but like like he he got the he got the cup it took him three years to win and then he could only win on the two mile speedways yeah and then he would go just complete just dis disappear yeah. and then oh here's a richmond win and then no wins in the next season and then has to go to dover in the fall of oh 2019 to win and then 2020 happens and so i had like i'm not a person who buys into hype of people as they're moving up i'm a person's like they got to get to cup and they got to do it in cup so uh and he he was an average driver for six years he was he was in an average car and let me give you let me let me tell you the moment that i i concluded this so who did kyle larson replace uh jp JPN, okay. yeah. Montoya. Yeah. So people will make fun of Montoya, NASCAR fans who don't understand what he did in F1 driving second tier cars. He was never with the, an elite team. He was always in that second group. And then he comes over and, you know, he, he had the Indy 500 win and he had the, the cart championship and people said, ah, well, he never did it in NASCAR. And and this a similar conversation we're having about Larson, right? And uh, well, well, wait, well uh, I mean, Montoya like, was limited by that same car, that same team, which is right there in the middle. And I still maintain you stick Juan Montoya in a Hendrick car and a Gibbs car, he wins a championship. I really believe that in NASCAR. Maybe. Well, well I, I, I mean, I think what Montoya did was impressive because how many drivers can say they won in Cup, IndyCar, 
in Formula One. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. So are you going to hold? Are you going to hold it against so, him that he really didn't do it in NASCAR though? Because it's the same conversation. <laughs> no, well, you know, Larson that. hasn't competed in IndyCar Formula One. <laughs> so. Sure, but I think you're dismissing what it means to do it in the Chili Bowl. I think you're dismissing, although he's never won Knoxville Nationals, he's been in the mix there. I think you are dismissing the caliber of talent that is there. I really believe that people sleep on it, which is why, by the way. This is why Toyota spends the money they do yeah. to cultivate drivers in that discipline because they wanted Bell to win against that talent pool before coming here. So, yeah, I mean, F1 and IndyCar, cart, uh, completely different thing. But so is dirt. You, you stick a stick Lewis Hamilton in a midget, a chili bowl. He ain't going to go nowhere. <laughs> you never know. He's not. <laughs> he's not. Like, for a fact, he's not. Yeah, uh, probably. All right. So, Crow, what, what, what have you thought? I mean, Larson was your guy back in 2017 when you briefly got back into NASCAR. So what, what have you been thinking of him through six races? Well, well first of all, I would say um, it's nice to have my opinion of Montoya validated. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, so th the reason why I like Larson is because when I tried to get back into NASCAR like several years ago, um, I just found most of the driving styles kind of boring. Like, you know, we talked before, you know, I grew up going to dirt track racing and, you know, you sit, sit down and watch and the only driver when I, at that time that really looked like someone who came from a dirt background, like, you know, we, but the only one that looked like it to me was Larson. And I felt like you're talking about with Montoya, I always felt like he was pushing his equipment to the point to where it was failing, not necessarily breaking, but he would, he would, he knew he would push it things a little bit too far, and it would cost him. Um, and so I always thought, you know, if he could get to you know a Hendrick spot or something of equal, you know, equal caliber, he'd do well. And I, I feel like he's doing that now, um, because I feel like he's he's got the equipment, and he's got that support um, to capitalize on. Any follow up, Matt? No, I mean, I, I've said my piece on Juan, and I just, I really yeah. believe, I mean, here's the deal. So he, he struggles in NASCAR relatively. I mean, I think struggle is probably unfair. He, he was a top 15 guy, but his NASCAR tenure plays itself out, and he goes back to IndyCar with Roger Penske. He should have won the championship that year. He was, mm -hmm. he was screwed by the, uh, the double points scenario. He was a points leader going into Sonoma that year. And he actually ended up in a tie with Dixon. And that's how Dixon won the championship based on the tiebreaker. Montoya should have won the IndyCar championship that year. So I just, I think he was a phenomenal driver who, to James point, he was on the chip. He drove the piss out of race cars. Like, by the way, I talk about top five drivers I've ever covered. Mm -hmm. Montoya too. I think Montoya and Larson are both there. Uh, Stewart, I put Stewart there. I would need to think about it, but I think those three guys are immediately top three racers I've ever seen. And I, it's just a shame that Montoya is is never going to get the opportunity. Never got the opportunity that Larson's getting now because we're about to see Larson go next level. Well, what, one thing I was because um, I'm surprised he's been able to do what he's been able to do through six races, just because he was gone for all but four races last year. And I was expecting at least through these first early stages it, for it, for Hendrick anyway, to be Chase Elliott and maybe Bowman, but that's completely flipped. Did you um, feel that way about Kyle Busch in 15 though? Cause he was gone for several months too. I mean, no, I didn't No, I wasn't expecting him to win. I mean, yeah. After, My point is, after like those leg injuries, injury. those were leg. That was a physical thing, though. Yeah, right, that, right. that that wasn't that wasn't. I he did say a racial slur on iRacing racing and they no. got suspended. He, he, he is, was physically hurt for. Yeah, my, my thing is though, this is all upstairs. Everyone thinks that racing is the physical, the muscle memory. And it is to a degree, but the things, the thing that gives you all those commands are upstairs, and so you know you're you're away for half a year, a year that doesn't go away it's just a matter of getting that muscle memory back yeah yeah i didn't think bush was gonna win anything that year i didn't let alone the championship but he did so <laughs> all right all right so uh crow it's time for our weekly segment what time is it 
you gonna do the do 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 <laughs> no we don't do. have to <laughs> it's it's time for mcdowell watch all we right a soundboard so that we're, when we're doing these like live live to tape recordings we can still play it <laughs> yeah that would be cool um all right mike michael mcdowell at atlanta motor speedway uh he started 18th uh finished 19th uh that was his Best career finish at Atlanta in 11 starts. Um, he's now he uh, finished 19th in stage two, and never lost a position from there, from the end of stage two to the end of the race. Um, he uh, beat guys like Christopher Bell, Eric Almarola, Chase Briscoe, uh, Austin Cindric in his second career Cup start. Eric Jones, uh, Tyler Reddick, and Brad Kozlowski. Um, so he had his best day ever at Atlanta and beat some. Beat some name guys. Uh, it, should be, it should be noted that Brad Kozlowski uh, ran into the back of Martin Truex Jr. in the middle of the race, and that kind of put him out for the day. Um, and he is now 13th heading in the standings, heading to Dirt Bristol, which nobody has any stats on uh, Dirt Bristol. So we, we have nothing to preview Michael McDowell for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Matt. What have you thought of uh, what Michael McDowell has done since winning the Daytona 500? Yeah, I was I was hoping we could talk about this. I am I I, I cannot wait for the playoffs because I listen. I, they're not going to win the championship. I, I feel pretty confident <laughs> in saying that. I don't I don't want to kill this segment for the rest of the year. But like, oh no, I mean I I, I don't think we're we're breaking any you know boundaries or territory by by making this bold prediction but I do think they can advance. Mm -hmm. I think there's enough road course races the rest of this regular season. They could maybe win another race. He is that good of a road racer and their stuff is that good right now. Listen, it's the last year of the current generation car. There's no more mm -hmm. secrets. Everyone, everyone's been under mm -hmm. the same rule packages for, for, the, for the short tracks and road courses two years for the high downforce stuff, which is already kind of an, a great equalizer. Uh, three years now so you've got what you got and i think it's easier to get top level chassis right now because teams are trying to sell them just to get something back for them so a team like front row is able to get better equipment than they've had ever before and they've got a really good race car driver in michael mcdowell who he's just he's smart he knows the he, he spent enough time driving for mid-pack back marker teams where the number one goal is just don't tear it up yeah you you give him a good car but not a great car but a good car this is what you get i think he could contend for maybe another win on a road course certainly talladega and daytona again and i'm just very curious to see if they can get into that that round of 12 and maybe knock on wood maybe contend for a round of eight i don't think it's going to happen oh that's pushing I, it that is, it is. pushing it it is, but the thing is, so here's the deal. So you get to that that round of eight, and then you have the Texas, and you have the Kansas. Crazy things happen, right? Plus, you mm -hmm. have the Charlotte Roval and Talladega in that round before. If he can get to the round that has Charlotte Roval and Talladega, that's right there in their wheelhouse. Oh, yeah, that, that is that is one <laughs> that is one, right. one round. And think about it. It's March. We're talking about Cinderella yeah. stories, and yeah. there are there are Oral Roberts, and so if they can just get to that round, and it's got Talladega, and it's got the Roval, ooh, that's awfully appealing. He he, they have got to get stage points at some at, at some point, and they they haven't done that. They have no. no stage points, nothing. Um, I wish that his that we could have seen what he could have done on the Day Daytona Road Course had he not, you know lost a tire and then shot off into turn one like he did that kind of even though he still finished in the top 10 um i would like to have seen what what he could have done there Listen, and here's then the deal. here's the deal they're going to be challenged by tracks that have a greater emphasis on mechanical grip mm -hmm. i mean if you look at where they've really excelled it's tracks that are aero grip that's their program right now is the road courses because he's a really good road racer I think they can get by on the short tracks but when it comes to the downforce program, the super abrasive tracks to where mechanical grip is going to play more of a role. I don't think that's their forte, but you go to a place like Kansas, 
place like the Coke 600, I think they're going to surprise you there because their aero grip department is so good right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to win one of those races, but I I think they're going to have to win on the road course or a super speedway. But I'm glad you guys are doing this segment because I think Dowell Watch is something that's going to be a fun narrative to follow as we get closer to the playoffs. Oh, oh no, that, that, that was, I mean, why we wanted to do it. It was like, okay, this guy's in the playoffs. Like, okay, now what? Um, and like, you know, if you, if anyone's been paying attention, like, like Homestead got his best finish ever at Homestead. He was there at the end, finished sixth. And even though he had no, no one was talking about him Sunday, he got his best career finish at Atlanta. So, I mean, things are looking good in some areas for them so um it and we're still early uh you you got like you you brought up the road courses i i don't know what to expect from him on dirt so it, 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 i'm interested to see oh um, we first, i guess let's just go ahead and get into bristol dirt okay matt so first off um how many publications do you cover because i'm curious if how many publications publications do you write for? Because I'm curious if you can even keep track of them. I don't know. Is, is the video going to be published of this or just audio? Oh no, no, we're we're uh, no. The, there, there's going to be a podcast version that's kind of more condensed, but I'm planning on just throwing everything up on YouTube. Well, and the reason I ask is like the best answer I can give you is this, which is me <laughs> shrugging. So for anyone who's listening, I'm I'm shrugging right now. Uh, let's count. Let's do like um. The Sesame Street, the count, you know, auto week, one. Yeah. <laughs> Short track <laughs> scene, two. two. I, I just joined uh, Flow Sport, Flow Racing. So okay. three. Three. Um, I, I do the Athlon <laughs> Sport Magazine every year. Four. Okay. I think we're done. I think. So four. Well, listen, okay. This is nothing because there was one year I went to, um, to Speed Weeks. And I was a freelancer back then, so I, I wasn't full time at Auto Week, but I was freelancing for Auto Week. I was freelancing for Racer.com, USA Today. I had one byline on the Associated Press, a website called About.com. I was doing short track that. stuff for um, Race 22. This is before I started um, short track scene. And I was trying to balance all of these uh, a, a popular speed. I was still at popular speed too. So that was 2016. And so I was balancing eight different publications assignments. So wow. <laughs> you know, four, you know, three most weekends, ah, not a big deal. In my head, you're still writing for all of them. So... <laughs> Me too. Okay. So, so for how many of those publications do you cover dirt racing? So the truth is I do not have a great deal of experience doing dirt. Okay. So let's go back in time a little bit. I'm actually an old dirt racer. My grandpa and dad both raced dirt. My dad still races dirt. He runs a, uh, I think they call the division um, Pure Stock. He okay. runs Pure Stock in South Alabama, the, the Florida Panhandle. So he's still a dirt guy. I race carts and legends on dirt, same okay. racetracks. Um, actually, the first place that I ever raced at is called um, Sunny South, but it used to be called J and J. It was a dirt track back then. It's paved now. Um, the ARCA driver Connor Okrezik, he's run a couple of ARCA races, uh, late model stuff. Connor's family actually operates that place. We're off. We're off track. We're off topic. Um, point is, I have a little bit of dirt background with my okay. family, and I've raced dirt, but I've never really covered it. I went to Chili Bowl three years ago, and I've never covered uh, open wheel midgets, late models, sprint cars. But I remember Lisa at Toyota told me, you're going to go do Chili Bowl, and it's going to change your life, and you're never going to miss a Chili Bowl again. (laughs) And this was 2018, and I have never missed a Chili Bowl since then. And I've really started to fall in love with the culture. Mm-hmm. Not so much the late, late models. I'm a pavement late model guy. But the sprint cars and the midgets, the power to, to weight ratio, the personalities, so much fun. So I put some feelers out on, on social media earlier this year. I said, look, 
I still want to cover NASCAR and IndyCar and do all the things that I'm doing for Auto Week. Still want to do that, but I'm looking for a place to do a little bit more sprint cars and midgets. Mm-hmm. Auto Week doesn't want it. Is anyone interested? And that's how the the flow racing flow okay. sport deal came together. So we're starting that on April 1st. So technically okay. I'm not even working there yet. We're going to start on <laughs> April 1st and okay. cover the world of outlaws, the all-star circuit of champions, uh, so, USAC. So you, you get to cover dirt, uh, NASCAR on dirt at Bristol. And then you can basically just, go, yeah, yeah. I covered dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, yeah, it's weird because I, the first time I ever went to a, to cover a dirt race was actually Eldora for the, the first ever yeah. truck race, okay. the dirt derby. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew jack nothing about dirt racing like most of us did, right? Yeah. But I, I think there was, there was a lot of us who, who came out of that, that experience at Eldora kind of changed in some ways. The, the NASCAR notables that I see now at dirt races all the time, Chili Bowl, Knoxville, is, you know, Gluck. Gluck has come away with a yeah. brand new appreciation for it the last couple of years. He's always at Knoxville, always at Chili Bowl. But also the Spencers, you know, uh, Reed and, and Lee Spencer. Um, I see them at a ton of dirt races now too. And I think Eldora did such a good job serving as a bridge between these two disciplines, NASCAR mm. and some form of grassroots racing. And that's what I hope Bristol is. I hope that it, whether it's a good race or a bad race, yeah, <laughs> I just hope that it's a way to bridge racing fans from multiple disciplines together in our shared love of race cars going in circles. So, okay. So my perspective, like this today, I, you know, published, published a column at frontstretch.com where I basically just say up top, I'm not a fan of dirt racing. Um, wasn't raised on we it noticed earlier. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I noticed earlier talking about Larson. Yeah. I'm not, I, I wasn't raised on it. I've, my dad took me to like two dirt races as a kid that I don't remember. Um, I've I've always just been watch NASCAR on Sunday, Saturday or Friday. That's that's all I care about because like it t- it just seems like it takes so much effort to be able to watch dirt races from home in any capacity, inexpensive. So it, it that that that's a barrier for me. That's one of it them. Is. Um. So, but I've just I'm a pavement guy. I I want to watch the forty best drivers in in the world on sunday um but like you i mean yeah i watched the dirt derby i love the dirt derby i watched it i think i watched it every year and while while it didn't get make me want to watch short track racing on dirt it made me want to watch nascar on dirt and i thought from was it 2013 or 14 that was the first 13 13 okay i i I thought from that point forward that it was going to be inevitable that we'd get a cup race on dirt at some point. Um, and and I, I know the, the interest in the dirt race at Eldora kind of tapered off there toward, towards the end, but I looked forward to it every year. And then they, you know, dropped this bomb on us last year. Hey, we're going dirt racing at Bristol. Um, I'm like, yes, yes, please. Um, I don't, I, I'm not one of the, I, I know there's lots of people who don't think it's going to work because it's not a natural dirt track it's like there's dirt on the track so as far as i'm concerned it's a dirt track <laughs> so um i mean what, 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 when, when, they, when they announced bristol dirt what was your immediate reaction um i wasn't as shocked as maybe i should be because i i know i've got a lot of friends down at bristol and you, you kind of read the tea leaves a little bit um they did this 20 years ago something similar they covered yeah. the track in dirt. Yeah, they, they did it for the World of Outlaw sprint cars and, and late models. And I've seen some of their data and I've, I've been a part of some of their their studies. And the the fans in that region, they're when they do their end of the year surveys to their 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 NASCAR audience. The number one response they, they've gotten for the past 20 years. Oh, yeah, well, we, we love the night race or we love NASCAR and. Yeah we, yeah, we want more more content. We like the K&N cars, or the Modified Tour, whatever. But they want dirt. And consistently for 20 years, that was the number one thing on their survey. Mm-hmm. Their NASCAR fans said, we want a dirt race. And so this is how it happened. 
if you look at the spring the spring race, I I remember I stood on top of Victory Lane, um, two thousand and nineteen, the last race before COVID, the last spring race before COVID, and I did like a three sixty with my my camera phone, and it's a lot of people, but it doesn't look like a lot of people. Because well, that's the one where they closed off sections. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I thought they they screwed themselves over by doing but that because they made it look worse. Yeah, but it still looks sparse. <laughs> Because it's still tall. I mean, here's the deal. 30,000 people there looks like 30, right? But 30,000 still ain't a good number. I mean, it's mm -mm. it's fine. It's fine. You stick 30,000 at Kentucky or 30,000 at um, Martinsville. It's fine, right? Yeah. But this is a place that used to, there used, to be, there used to be a waiting list yeah. for the night yeah. race. Yeah. And even the spring race was close to sold out. And so... You put that on a blender and you think the spring race needs some kind of jolt. Yeah. This, our NASCAR fans are even telling us we want some dirt race, whether NASCAR is there or not. You throw it into a blender and this was like the natural outcome. It, it felt inevitable. I hate that we had to lose a, a pavement short track race to get it. But ultimately, if you were to ask me, how do I feel about it? Yeah. This race could suck. I, it could be a disaster. It could be single file, follow the leader, not enough grip to even do the bump and run, or it could be a crash <laughs> fest, whatever. I appreciate NASCAR is trying something different. Yep. We, get, we get to see something different. I'm going this week. Lucky. And I told a, a mutual friend of ours who works at NASCAR, but I was on the phone with a, a NASCAR person earlier this week, and we we're just talking about Bristol. And I said, um, it's even places that I love, like the Indianapolis 500 or going to the Daytona 500 or going to the Bristol night race, the Southern 500, races that I love, that I look forward to. I make those drives knowing what I'm going to get. Even if I love it, mm -hmm. I know what it's going to be. It is so rare to do anything in, in NASCAR or, or motorsports where you drive to the racetrack and you have no idea what the hell you're going to get. Yeah. And that's cool. That is cool as hell to me. I'm going to yeah. drive to Bristol on Thursday and I'm not going to be thinking about, Oh, the Bush brothers are good there. Nope. Um, <laughs> but whatever. I have no idea what we're going to see. I don't know who's going to be good. I don't know if Chris Wyndham can, can, can win <laughs> in, a, in a wear car Please. or whatever. Right. Oh my gosh. We don't know. We don't know. And that's yeah. cool as hell. When in, in 2013, in the build up to Eldora, I thought at the time that, that had to be the most anticipated NASCAR event any series since the 94 Brickyard 400. Had to be. And it was a truck series race. And then, then you fast forward to the Roval in Charlotte. I was like, this is the biggest, most anticipated race since the 94 Brickyard 400. And that, that race paid off. Um, and then now we're now we're getting this and i'm like is i don't know how to compare this to the roval um but it yeah this is for for a cup race in the middle of march or the end of march um when you, we get you got march madness going on baseball's about to start um to have this excitement level around a cup race is just really really cool it is it is and i'm again. hoping I'm looking at the weather forecast for this week, and I'm like, oh, please no. Please no. Let, let, let me counter that. Like, I think the weekend looks good. I love that it's thunderstorming tomorrow and Thursday, maybe even a little early on Friday <coughs> if, if the forecast holds. That track needs a lot of moisture because yeah. when you said earlier, well, there's dirt on it. It's a, it's a real dirt track as far as you're concerned. <laughs> this, is, this is the only pushback I'll give you. You're yeah, right. The, it's, it's a real dirt track. But when you have a real dirt track, the moisture can can seep into yeah there's no concrete under it. yeah and there's there's i know there's concrete <laughs> so it has nowhere to go but to, to dry up and yeah. we've seen it with the late model races and the modified races it needs a lot of moisture for even the first couple of races even when you try to put moisture back into it it doesn't retain water at all so I, yeah i'm actually happy we're, we're gonna have a lot of rain wednesday and thursday because we need it well, yeah, Chris Buescher today in his media availability, um, he's, I, I asked him, like, what surprised you about the, the track when he, were, he was in the, the Bristol Dirt Nationals last week? And he, he said he was very surprised by how dusty the track was. 
Um, and he said it, he thought it was going to be inevitable that they'll have to like treat the track during the stage breaks. So um, if but you can't though. So listen, here's the thing. So like, you watched Chili Bowl this year, right? No. No. Okay. Well, I was. I don't blame you. And let me tell you why I don't blame you. A lot of people rejected. It took an hour. To, it, it took an hour to get a track. Hour prepped. and fifteen minutes to get the track prepped for the A main. Yeah. That's what you would have to do in between every stage. Now, the pushback I got from a friend of mine, who who is just a dirt person, is like, SMI has a ton of money. It's only a half mile. You can have tiller is working in one and two and another tiller in three and four at the same time and you can do it in 20 minutes and you can go to pit road and talk to drivers make a show out of it i don't know if 20 minutes is still too long probably but to your point there's not going to be enough time to work that track in and it's going to be it's going to be like a pavement right it's gonna be like a slippery pavement track. <laughs> it's funny Here, here's the thing people have been clamoring for Bristol to go back to being, you know, bottom feeding, single lane on the bottom, bump and run. I, I, it just took throwing clay on it to do it. <laughs> I'm one of the people who who have oh, thoroughly, like, yeah. Like, I, I'm one. I'm one of the people who th- has thoroughly enjoyed like, Bristol races can, since they went to putting down the tar or whatever on the bottom. I've been. I thought they've been great. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, this is fun. So, but I think for the for those of you who want the bump and run and the beating yeah. and banging Bristol, it yeah. just took getting clay on the track. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I Busher also said he thinks it's going to be a more physical race than it would have been, been on pavement. And he said, yeah, he said like the cars are going to be just tore to hell. So, <laughs> which is which I, I think one like one of the things they've done to the cars is I think they've they've reinforced the right side a little bit. So that, <laughs> so like just so they can get to the end um so crow, crow your thoughts so far on your, your excitement levels for this weekend i mean, i'm pretty let's say i'm pretty excited um the one thing that i am i like about a lot of dirt tracks um at least that i'm used to is uh the corners are are open which obviously you can't have at bristol because there's walls all the way around um because that's always a nice like extra challenge when people do go on the high line and they go off the off the top and then they have to jump back on um but uh but yeah I'm, I'm excited um the yeah i think track conditions are, are probably the biggest concern because it's not an established track and you know even if they have experts in there you know you how you treat and maintain the track is something you kind of develop over time with their track um, and this is a temporary thing but with that said there are you, you do have experts that come in like uh here in st louis they uh actually do um racing inside the dome where the rams used to play and so they'll come in and build a dirt track inside of the dome um and they're able to do that and you know have a decent racing service um honestly they did a modified race at one point um recently I used to live like across the street from it downtown and you could actually hear it in our apartment. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested in see, and I just hope it goes well because I want more, more variants in the tracks that the cup series runs. You know, I think the, the more variants, the better and the more diverse of a fan pool you can pull from. Oh well, yeah. I mean, yeah. How, how do talk- you feel about street courses? Oh, I love them. I, I, I would love for them to be like, like a legitimate, like we're going to shut down like this part of this city and race NASCAR cars in it. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've wanted that for a few years because like when it comes to open wheel, I hate street courses. I think they're horrible. Um, sorry, sorry, uh, Long Beach. Um, but I would like, I think stock cars would be perfect for street course because you have bumpers. It, do, it doesn't matter how narrow or how wide the track is. Like you can use that bumper to get around a guy, and I think that that, that would just be a slugfest. So the NASCAR Penty Series north of the border in Canada, yeah. they run short tracks, road courses, and street courses. They run two street courses: Toronto, the streets of Toronto, alongside IndyCar, and their their biggest event of the year is actually the streets of Trois-Rivières and Trois-Rivières and 
Toronto are two of the just most dramatic, just, they're just balling. They're fun because these guys are bouncing off each other and, you know, door slamming. It's Martinsville with right turns. And I think the mm-hmm. closest thing that you have to a, a street course in recent NASCAR history is actually Montreal. It, it's a road course. It's not, yeah. a, it's not streets, but it's flat sharp turns long straights it runs like a street course and oh yeah those nascar uh nationwide races at um cirque gilvenu were some of the most exciting races from start to finish of any stretch of races anywhere in nascar history and i think that's just evidence that a street course could work also mexico city yeah that's more of a traditional road course it's winding there's elevation changes to where To where uh, Montreal, Cirque Gilvenau is just so flat. It was flat all the way around. There was no elevation shift at all. Yeah, but no, I, I like Crow. You chose you chose a good year to get into the the Cup Series at least because this is the most radical schedule <laughs> since 1970, basically. Yeah, so. I, one of the thi- the like I'm not super into it just because it's hard to even have access to to like it. But I, I really like Rally X racing. Um, now, it, obviously, you're not going to have jumps and stuff in an NASCAR Cup Series race, but I do think that it, they could take some inspiration from that and even do some interesting races with the, uh, like, their combination track and city races um, where you utilize part of a track, utilize part of a parking lot, um, and do some really interesting stuff with that. Obviously, that's a long ways away if that ever were to happen, but I mean, that's one thing that I've, I, since a kid, I was a kid, and you would drive past the speed, speedway somewhere. That's a, that's what my imagination would go to. It's like, man, it'd be awesome if they like, you know, turned here out of the track and then ran laps around the parking lot and went back in. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that reminds me of in Indianapolis. They have this. I think it's called the Speed Drome, or whatever. It's a figure eight track that I wish I'd been able to go to when I lived in Indianapolis. Because I, I want to see a figure eight track. <laughs> so. Okay, Tony. Back or down smoke. Oh, oh. <laughs> not, not in the Cup Series. Not in the Cup Series. I don't want a figure eight track. I'd I say, just... You know what I'm referencing there, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Talladega? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So, Matt, you did you did a story on all the prep that went into making the um, making the Bristol Dirt Race possibility. What, what, so, in your reporting on that, what was the most surprising thing to you about what it took to put, get this, make this race a reality? I wouldn't say it was surprising um, because, because it's very similar to what they've done 20 years ago. I and mean, I remember having conversations with a bunch of SMI people about the process 20 years ago, and it, it's not too much different. So I wouldn't say I'm surprised, but I'll tell you the one thing that was different from 20 years ago, because for the most part, they did a good job. 20 years ago, like, you know, considering what they had to work with, it was pretty seamless. But the difference from 2000 and 2001 to 2021 is that they're using satellite GPS information to be able to build this track. And so they would have all these different tractors and tillers, and they would all be connected to satellites. And they have computer SIM data now that they were able to build the track digitally to where the GPS would tell you, put the dirt here, put the dirt here, put the dirt there. And the ways that you would go about constructing each level to where 20 years ago, they did it by by visual. They just did it by instinct. And (laughs) it was kind of, it's way more precise now than it was 20 years ago. So that's not a surprise because everything we do now is way more precise. I mean, it kind of reminds me of a chili bowl last year. Um, Something was wrong in turns one and two and you could see it in the racing there was there was no second groove and the only way you could really complete passes was like a bump and run in an open wheel midget so it was kind of a, a disaster yeah and so i racing had scanned the track the year before and i racing actually connected oh, with wow. the promoters and said look at our scan and see what's off and the the way they cut the track was off by seven feet and they were able to use the iRacing scan to rebuild the track to the iRacing spec from the previous year. And they made the track perfect through iRacing. 
And I actually, wow. I read that story. So if you actually go back and find that story, it was really cool. They rebuilt the track overnight and cut the seven feet off to make the apex the way it was oh, wow. on iRacing. So it's the same thing with Bristol Dirt, right? Where 20 years ago, they did it by, by eye, by visual. They actually have computer simulation data and GPS satellites to direct the construction of the track. So I'm not surprised, mm. but I thought that was cool. Well, uh, one thing one thing I didn't get from your, your story is like they're they're racing on the same dirt that, that they used 20 years ago. Kinda, like they, kinda, kinda. Or they they like they had it in storage somewhere yeah. nearby. I was like, why why are they having it in storage? They they knew they would do this again. They, they've always known. So the the base layer is like the the hayseed or like the whatever you want to call it, the brush, whatever. The second layer of dirt was the top layer of dirt 20 years yeah. ago. Okay. But the challenge they ran into is so the racing surface, what you see on, on top. It's tough because if you're not a dirt racing fan, so I know y'all aren't. So what y'all need to know is like dirt's not universal, which I know that's, that sounds kind of like, duh, of course, right? Oh, yeah, I know there's different kinds of dirt. Yeah. But the, tra- but the, the dirt you guys have out there in like Arkansas and Texas is fundamentally different than the dirt which is kind of a black clay in the Midwest and in Tennessee and Georgia, you've got this red sandy clay. <clears throat> and so the thing that I thought was interesting and I wrote it in the story was that they had to send multiple samples of the clay and dirt to an expert in California to be able to determine is the, the pH levels, the sand levels, is this good enough for racing? Because they wanted to build it better than they did 20 years ago because you've got NASCAR here now. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought that part was interesting in the sense that they just put a lot more thought and heart into it because they wanted the, the, the best soil possible. And, you know, this Tennessee, this, this Tennessee dirt is so sandy and so dusty. So it's going to be super abrasive. It's going to be a hard race to watch from the mm-hmm. grandstands. because I think it's going to be a really dusty racetrack. Oh, I wish they could have got dirt from somewhere in the Midwest it would have been a better racetrack less sandy but again like whatever it's different it's fun it's cool maybe it'll be awesome i don't know incidentally um this year everyone will be wearing masks that's right no, no, so <laughs> well, listen they're, they're supposed to wear a mask well yeah but no listen to your <laughs> to your point crow we we were joking at chili bowl you know a chili bowl the chili bowl got, flu the chili bowl flu the chili bowl flu so yeah. you've got like and I, I mean this respectfully and i i mean it with love but you've got like typically generally speaking the most like super conservative like hard-nosed stubborn i'm not wearing a mask types and listen yeah. those are my people like i'm from alabama i get it okay but like this year chili bowl everyone's masked up because you have to be mm-hmm. and I remember so many people saying, this is the best I've ever felt after after Chili Bowl. I didn't get the Chili Bowl flu this year. <laughs> I wonder why. I, I, I can't imagine because they were kicking you out if you if you didn't have a yeah. mask. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go to Bristol this year. Even the people who don't want to wear a mask, they're going to need a mask because it's going to be super dusty. And it's going to be like, man, I feel great. I wonder why. So, okay. So what are your concerns about this being a 250 lap race? It's not going to be a dirt track 50 laps into the race. <laughs> no, seriously. So listen, uh, we've seen it. Go back and watch um, the truck series races at Eldora. The way that track starts and the way it finishes, it, 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 it rubbers up pretty well at the end. And it's a, one, it's a one lane race track. And you're going to have to use the bumper to complete passes. It's not going to be multiple grooves. Now double it. And the other part that's super weird, and I, I wish I understood why, and no one's really gave me a straight answer. It's a day race. So it's going to mm-hmm. be underneath the sun, which is going to dry the track out even more than what you saw at Eldora when it was a night race, more than the truck race the night before. That sun is going to cook turns one and two. That place is going to dry out in a hurry, and it's not going to be a dirt track. And I don't know if it's going to be one groove on the bottom, one groove in the middle, but there's going to be one predominant way around the racetrack. And I believe the only way to pass is going to be moving people out of the way, which is why I say it goes back to old Bristol. You want the bump and run, you're going to get it. It's just going to be a lot slower and a lot slippier. So, okay. Everyone's talking about Kyle Larson. Everyone's talking about Christopher Bell. I know um, 
at the I think it was you who asked um Austin Dillon today about that Larson said watch out for Austin Dillon um and that I mean even, even though I know Austin Dillon won at Eldora um I, I haven't really been giving him much thought going to this race um I personally think my gut feeling is it, the guy who comes out on top isn't gonna be someone we're talking about that's just my gut feeling I agree it's it's someone's gonna come out of left field and we're like what in the world um so like so okay so you agree with me why do you agree so i think that all the elements of this this racetrack and 250 laps on dirt i don't think that any guy with a dirt background even like a larson and a seabell and a, a chris busher who grew up doing dirt racing too uh stenhouse no one who's ever run dirt will have ever in their lives seen a dirt track that have the conditions of Bristol after lap 100, lap 150, mm-hmm. because you just don't have an hour to rework the track. We'll, we will have never seen a track that, that slicks out, takes this much rubber. It's just never been seen. Like, who was it? It was, um, I think it was Kevin Harvick who said that, um, I forget, I forget how Kevin worded it, but he's it's like, it's going to be the longest dirt race. In the, the longest dirt race. Yeah. <laughs> this is just not going to be a dirt track anymore. It's going to yeah. take so much rubber. So my point is, I don't think there are, there is any background sprint car, late model midget that replicates what this track is going to be. And it's, it's very similar to when, when Bubba Wallace, we, we, we had a, a, a media availability with Bubba today and, you know, Bubba won the second race at Eldora. Yeah. And Bubba did not have a dirt background. He had not raced dirt. And he won that race. He beat Larson, who is like a dirt ace. What was that what that was the year where Larson's like wasn't like beat the hell out of his truck? <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the bed was like broken and yeah. he's like slapping the wall trying yeah. to chase down Bubba. Yeah. I, I watched that in a Buffalo Wild Wings in Indianapolis, and that was just the the coolest and just weirdest thing yeah. I had ever seen. <laughs> And listen, to my point, like, it feels like bizarro world that, like, one of the most accomplished dirt racers, especially now, Kyle Larson, was having to beat yeah. the holy hell out of his truck to chase down Bubba Wallace, who had maybe only been on dirt once in his life before that race. Yeah. And so that's my point about the, the Bristol Cup race. I don't think it's a given that mm-hmm. we're talking Larson, Bell, you know, a guy that I think could be interesting is Stenhouse. Stenhouse understands dirt. No, no, yeah, no, no. I think I've heard Stenhouse mentioned once in relation to, to, to this weekend's race. So that, that surprised me. And that's a shame because he, he understands dirt. I think that th- this is how I think the race is going to be. I think the first third of the race is going to be a traditional kind of dirt race. I think there's, there's going to be enough rain on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning that it's going to be a super tacky kind of a dirt track. And then it's going to become a track position race. And I think that if you can get track position, it sounds so weird, right? We're talking about Bristol dirt. But I think that if you can get, excuse me, if you can get track position in the first third when it starts to take rubber and it kind of, you know, single grooves out, if you have track position, you can make it last. And that's what happened to Bubba when he won in 2014. It was a super tacky dirt race early. He got the track position. And Larson, who's so good on dirt, he was second. And he just couldn't overcome the fact that the track had, had single grooved out. And he just drove in super hard every single corner trying to make something happen and just beat the hell out of his truck. I think we could see a similar thing, which, to your point, is why they've reinforced the right side of these cars. Because it's going to turn single groove. They're going to sail it in there. And they might even climb the bank in and kill the wall. You know, uh, Kyle Bush was talking about, I think it was Kyle Bush talking about it today, like, some, somebody, I can't remember, somebody today talked about static electricity and that's going to keep like dirt on the windshield um, and they're going to have like Swiffers in there cleaning. I was like, you know, why don't they have the, the, the windshield wipers that they use on road courses? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll do you one better. <laughs> Take out the windshield. Yeah, or that. Yeah. Yes, or that. Like, yeah. like, like a late model. Late models yeah. don't have them. Why do we need them for a cup car? You're not going to wind tunnel for a dirt race. Take out the <laughs> damn windshield. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with you there. Um, Dumb. So they, they've, they've also taken out the safer barriers um, 
that how how much wider does that make the track? Taking out the, like just a couple inches at most. No, it's weird because I don't know because I, I I haven't been yet, so I okay. haven't got a chance to really see it. It's more than just the safer barrier too. So they've 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 reduced the banking to uh, eighteen degrees. Yeah. So it's not it's taller, but it's not as high banked. Um, the safer isn't there. They had to redo the 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 crossover gate fence. Um, I don't know. I don't know how wide it. Well, plus too, the other part of it is too. It's, it's a wider track because they've uh, leveled out the the apron, so that's part of the racing surface too. Okay. So I think it makes for a, a much wider racetrack, but it's not just because of the safer. The safer is gone, and there's not as much uh, apron because that's now part of the racetrack. Okay. So you, you okay? You mentioned Bubba Wallace. Like, let's, like, we could just briefly touch on him in general. Um, I think the next two weeks could be very interesting for Bubba Wallace and 2311 racing Give, given Bubba's Eldora win. And also once we get to Martinsville, he's won there in the truck series and good Cobblish Motorsports equipment. Um, I, I think these next two weeks could be very um, good for that team as far as, far as putting together uh, a performance and just getting some attention that the that whole storyline needs uh to keep people's attention on it who are specifically t- tuning in for Bubba. I was wondering what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because like I think they are exactly where we thought they would be. I know that there is a narrative out there that oh well he's in JGR equipment so he needs to go win immediately. But I think that everyone told you it's not realistic. I think Bubba told you uh, earlier this year during his media availability before Daytona that our expectation is to win two races, yeah. probably get our feet under us in the spring and be ready to do that during the summer and fall. I, I not, not that I'm not a believer in what Bubba can do in the right situation or, or Mike Wheeler or any, anyone who's there. I just think that it's so hard to have a, a brand new program. Yeah. It's basically a fifth JGR car. I know that they'll fight you on that. It is. But even if they were, even if JGR was allowed to create a legit fifth car, and let's say they put Bubba Wallace in the legit fifth car. So even if it's a fully fledged JGR car, yeah. it would still take a while for this brand new team with mm-hmm. brand new people speaking brand new languages, learning each other to go contend right off the bat. And I think that I, I don't think that you know whatever happens at Eldora is whatever Martinsville whatever Br- Bristol Bristol yeah Bristol <laughs> uh, this Eldora yes yeah I, I was thinking Eldora because I was talking to yeah. him about Eldora earlier so I've got that <laughs> synapse still yeah. clicking yeah I think it's I think it's way too early to put any expectation to even try to have that narrative because I just don't think they're there yet and I don't think that because i don't think they can get there i just think that it's just super super early yeah because if 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 it had just been a straight up fifth jgr team like that's that then the whole organization has to recalibrate their output of resources to a new tentacle um that wasn't there last year and like this is a team that didn't exist that was announced in september or october uh, one of those and so it happened really late yeah um, i don't think fans really understand like um, uh, like imagine um i'm trying to think of putting this in terms that a a casual fan can understand let's say that you have let's say you have the money to buy a house okay and you just say you know what i'm gonna just go i've got to buy this house within a week and you give yourself a week to buy a house. It's not going to be the house you would have had if you had a year to think about it. <laughs> no, this is a yeah. terrible analogy, I know. <laughs> but the point is, when you have just a couple of months after deciding you're going to do something to do it, and you have to rush it, they rushed it. Yeah. It's going to take a while. But it was important that they rushed it because they wanted to make it happen this year. Because oh, they needed to have, make it happen this year. And not for the reasons I, I, don't, I don't think most people think, though. They want to be ready in 2022. They want to be ready in 2022 yeah. in the for the same reasons um, BJ and Matt want their team to be ready in 2022 that um, Justin Marks wants his team to be ready in 2022. I think that whatever happens this year is gravy. I know that Bubba wants to win too, 
but all of this was just about building communication cohesion to get ready for that new car yeah and whatever you get out of it this year it's gravy oh yeah um i I think i think suarez can steal a win at some point this year yeah i mean he 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 got he he was racing in the top 10 there in atlanta uh (laughs) what was that so for anyone who's just listening this is my um severe oh i remember that picture of you uh i i think i think there's no maybe not never mind keep going i mean i make this face a lot but i'm making my my disbelief face like listen i think the world of daniel suarez is a racer like i think that he is a i think he's a really good racer i'm not sure if he's an, an elite racer i think he's a really good racer i just don't think that team and that equipment is there yet and they've all told you this is about 2022 anyway i Mm. thought what they did on sunday i am flabbergasted i cannot believe they put together that kind of run flabbergasted i just don't think that's going to be the norm i think that's going to be their their ceiling is getting to the top 10 getting stage points getting a top 10 out of it flabbergasted maybe i'm wrong it's still early like when when you when what what is usually your measurement on like how a season will play out but like what race in a year are you usually like okay these are the players and this is what's what maybe you can spec the rest of the way because usually for me it's like okay let, let's get to the coke 600 race 13 you typically race 13 now it's race 15 Where, where's usually your mile marker i don't i don't know that i i look at it in those terms and I think this current playoff format has has changed the way that we evaluate seasons. So I was talking to a, a source, a friend of mine at, at SHR, and I, I want to do a story on SHR. So I'm talking to people kind of behind the scenes there. And one of the conclusions that we reached is, is that, listen, SHR was, they, they, they were at the detriment of the playoff format last year, the number four team, mm-hmm. they, they, they suffered a byproduct of, of this playoff format. Now they come out early 2021, they are getting their butts kicked by this new rear template that, that NASCAR yeah. has decided to, to implement this year. The feeling at SHR right now is that we can fix this. It's, it's going to take us a while, but we can fix it. June, it might take till June or July mm-hmm. to figure it out but we can fix this. So SHR, the, the four team, Rodney and, and Kevin, they're not going to get the, the playoff points and the stage wins and the wins they had last year. They're not going to win nine races this year, but it would be no. such a, um, there'd be, there, there would be a, a poetry to it that they can win the championship this year, only winning, you know, three or four races, getting their, their, their asses handed to them early <laughs> this year after having it taken from them last year. Yeah. They believe they can. I believe they can. So where I'm getting at is you asked me, how do you evaluate? The rules are changed now with this playoff format because we can get to the Coke 600. We can get to later in the summer. And if SHR combined only has one or two wins, you can't write them off because if they figure out this template come the Southern 500, then they go out and win the Southern 500, do like Tony Stewart did in 2011. Yeah. They go off on a roll of five of 10. Who cares what we thought during the Coke 600? Because the <laughs> rules are different once you get to the playoffs now. So there are things you can like conclude. I just don't think that it has any bearing on what happens in October and November to that point, the nine team. We, yeah. we kind of looked at them as being, well, they're, they're road course specialists. They've got a really good road course program. They've mm-hmm. got the, the R&D car, the, the, myth, the mythical R&D car they use. <laughs> um, but they, they figured out some stuff yeah. on, on the intermediates, and they got their short track program rolling really well. And I don't think – I'll tell you this. So you had the, the four, you had the 11, you had the two, and that was kind of your so-called big three. I know that's kind of an eye roll inducing term, but that was like the uh, big three. I'm so know, over it. I'm so over it. I know, I know. But if, if there was a power ranking, you would have had four, 11, two. I don't think you would have had the nine as a favorite to make the final four, much less win mm. it. And that was the knock on Chase and Allen is that you get to the round of eight and you keep coming up short 
he wins a championship. Yeah. So it just doesn't matter what we think race 12, race 17. It's about what you have when you get to race 27. Yeah. I mean, it's not just even Harvick this year. I mean, look, you could sort of have the same conversation about Hamlin. He's at this point last year, he had two wins. He's the points leader, but he's the points leader. Now he yeah. he's being, he's more consistent now than he was last year. Just, he has more top fives than he, he had at this point last year. Well, and it, I was going to tell you this too. So you asked me, well, do I have a point of the season where I try to evaluate? Even if I did, even if you do, I think you have to throw it out the window this year because you've never seen a season yeah, like correct. this. So like, yeah, you've got a dirt race thrown in the first 12, 13. When, when is the Coke 600? Is that race 12, 13? 15. It, 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 yeah. 15? Two years ago, it was race 13, but it's 15 now. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's say the Coke 600 is that kind of arbitrary cutoff point. Yeah. So by the time you get to race 15 this year, you're going to have a dirt race. You've already had a, a road course. You might have another road course you're close to going to. It's, it's a completely different game. And you've got all these different rule packages and the schedule is different. I don't know if we can reach any real conclusion this year more than ever because of the playoffs, but also now because of the schedule. All right. All right and well, and okay. the weirdest part is too, it's funny. We've talked about road courses and dirt racing and all that stuff. I still think we're sleeping on the intermediate package because when you, you're talking about 550, right? Yeah. 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 The, the okay. 550 package, the intermediate track package, Okay. because even with all these road courses and a dirt track to make the final four, you still have to be good at Texas and Kansas. <sighs> so it's still going to come down to how good your intermediate stuff is and how lucky you are. Knock, knock number four team at Texas and Kansas. Yeah because that's your pathway to Phoenix. And they were sw- they're, they're swapped from last year, right? Texas and Phoenix or Texas and Kansas, right? I don't remember. But the I point think, is it's still that so, that yeah. that round of 8 is still yeah. some combination yeah. of Texas, Kansas, Martinsville, Kansas, Texas, Texas, Kansas, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Texas, Arcana, Martinsville. <laughs> okay. All right, let, I guess before we uh get out um for next year, like we're not even done with this season, but is there any tweak? What tweaks do you want to see to the schedule next year? I, I want a street race, and I, I think race, we're getting okay. closer. I don't know if we're going to get it next year. There's going to be some things coming out here soon that are going to get the conversation rolling yeah. on street racing. Just take my word for it. So I, I think the conversation is going to start where we land as an industry. I don't know. Fontana is about to turn into a short track. So that's going to be another two, two one. Two years, two years. Yeah. I don't, I don't get why they didn't. All right, as soon as soon as that race got canceled this year, just start, start doing it. the bulldozing. Just start, just, just do it. It's like, oh no, we we want to get give the the classic configuration one. Le- no, who cares? No. <laughs> like, listen, I love that track. I love that track, but I love what new Fontana can be. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, Listen, Fairgrounds Nashville is still kind of hanging in the ether. In yeah. The perfect world, I would love to have Nashville Super Speedway if that market can support it. And keep in mind that Nashville is a steady top five television market yeah. for NASCAR. They can support two races, but I would love for summer to be at the Super Speedway, the playoffs to be at the Fairgrounds mm. downtown track. I think that would be a lot of fun. I want a street course. I would love a place like Chicago. Well, Na- really Nashville place. has a street course now, IndyCar. So it, yeah. it, it it's good. But, it's just... but no, 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 because people will reject it because they want the short track. <laughs> but I'm just saying it. that Nashville has all of a sudden become this apex for. It always was, Mer- though. People, I mean, people don't realize this. They have consistently been a top five TV market. We're talking yeah. Greenville, Charlotte, Indianapolis, Nashville. Um, I forget the other market. R- R- did, you, did you see Richmond? Richmond, yes. Rich, Richmond, your top five. Greensboro. 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 Yeah. So, so th- th- that's your, 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 but it's always Nashville. Nashville's always there. So I'm surprised it took this long to even get to this point, whether it was the super speedway, the fairgrounds, whatever. But it, it makes sense. I don't know about the street course because people will reject it because they want that short track. Mm-hmm. Listen, I, I guess you've never been, right? To, Nash, to, to the fairgrounds to, no you but, go there. but to, to, to go back to um how we started this whole conversation 
I, I recently watched part of the 1999 Bush race mm-hmm. at Fairgrounds. And that place was, that, that, right, that track was two years away from getting off the schedule. That track was packed in 1999. Yeah. And there hadn't been a cup race there since 1984, Four. I believe. I was like, so that blew my mind mm-hmm. that, that, that the place was packed and was two years away from getting off the schedule. The, so. the All-American 400, which is the marquee super late model race every year, still draws 7,000, 8,000 fans. Nashville loves stock car racing, and they love the fairgrounds. And where I'm getting at, step foot there, go to visit it, stop by at some point. You can actually stop and just walk in. The gates are always open. I shouldn't say that on the air, but you can. <laughs> just don't, don't, don't do stupid shit. Just go. It's like, it's like Wilkesboro. Just go and wave, say hi, take a picture, yeah. take a selfie go away <laughs> same, <laughs> same thing with national right okay. so go take a selfie go look at it but where i'm getting at is once you stand there and you look at it and especially if you've seen races on tv whether the 84 cup race which is on youtube or the 99 2000 bush races when you've seen it and then you go stand there and you can kind of see that it's unchanged mm-hmm. i've been to wilkesboro and i don't feel the same way about wilkesboro wilkesboro is a dump it's over. Let it go. Like it I, 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 I love gone. Wilkesboro. I wrote a feature story about Wilkesboro. Yeah. I love it, but it's over. It's done. Let it go. Nashville is thriving. It's in downtown Nashville, top five yeah. TV market. I, I know Br- or Bruton. I say Bruton, but Marcus. I know Marcus feels the same way, and and Dale has done a great job making this happen. It's going to happen, and the reason they all feel that way is when you stand there and you look at it and you feel it. Mm-hmm. It's special. So I want to see the fairgrounds. I want to see a street race. Um, I want to see less intermediates. I was so happy to see Kentucky and <laughs> Chicago get launched into the sun. Chicago had become like the last two races at Chicago were really good races. Yeah, they're fine. There's too many of them. I'm sick of. Dog- oh, no, I agree. I agree. I totally agree. Glad Kentucky's gone. Get rid of Kansas. Two days. Here's the thing. Get one no, one, no one went. No one went to Chicago. So we can talk about how fine it was. It was yeah. great for all seven people that saw it. Yeah. Like yeah. that's why I say if we can make a, a street course work, I would love to see it in Chicago. Just because I, I know they, they value that market. Mm-hmm. People do watch the races on TV there. And so if people don't want to go an hour to to Juliet, and that was part of it, people watch NASCAR on TV in the Chicago TV market. They just didn't leave to go an hour southwest mm. to Joliet. So if you can't if you can't make people go to the races, bring the race to them. Oh, I agree. I'd love to see a Chicago street race. Uh, that'd be. I want to see an Indianapolis street race. Um, that that'd be interesting. Well, so. speaking of things I want to see, IRP. Oh yeah, they're about I, to dump. I, I, they're about I, to dump ten million into that facility. Oh wow! And one heard... of their goals is to bring NASCAR back probably not cup but if we can just have trucks and xfinity there i was at the last i was at the last bush race there oh were you i I never saw a nascar race there really yeah oh i I have i have i i I have a one-up on matt weaver i don't think i was ever in the city of indianapolis until i met you (laughs) honest to god really you were one of the first things i knew about indy huh was that 2013 2014 2014 may my first year going to indy was 2013 for um yeah it was 2013 for the nascar race mm. and my first 500 was one year later 14 okay so, oh so we, we share that okay yeah. all right but yeah i, I have a one-up on matt on something awesome <laughs> I, w- I went to the last bush race at irp i heard so i heard like a rumor like that like maybe like sheldon creed mentioned on a podcast that if for some reason they can't go to canada the truck yeah, series will too. race at irp it's so, like yeah Listen, I want to cross the border so bad because I love the Penty series and I, I plan to go to Trois-Rivières and plan to go to Cirque Icar and to all these cool racetracks that I go to every summer. But if it means that we can have one IRP race back, mm-hmm. shut the border down. I don't want to be <laughs> for another 12 months. I don't want to see all my Canadian friends until 2022. I, I will make that yeah. sacrifice and I love Canada. I go to Canada every year. I vacation in Montreal. I will give all of that up for a NASCAR national touring race at Lucas Oil Speedway. Uh, that would be great to see. All right, so okay, so let's close this thing out. For okay, Crow, um, final thoughts on Bristol Dirt and who do you think will win? I mean, that's 
I still think that there's a good chance that we'll see uh, Larson winning. Um, he does have that dirt background, but he he's done so well in a variety of dirt series. I think that, that that's the one key thing there. Um, but as as we mentioned earlier, it's kind of up in the air. Like there's there's no certainty mm-hmm. at all about what will happen. All right, Matt. So um, <laughs> I do this for Daytona and Talladega. So I go to random.org. And I did a <laughs> random number generator to pick races for me, which by the way, I have, I have successfully picked three super speedway races, including two Daytona 500s using oh, wow. random.org. But wow. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for the, the dirt track. Okay. Time. So I just went to random.org. You guys can play this game too. I clicked generate a couple of times, number one through 99. And there was a couple of numbers that aren't used. Like I got 71 and I got uh, 98, but I got 24. I don't know if I agree with random.org. I don't know. But you know what? Let's go with it. Let's go with William Byron. Let's get weird. Let's get so weird. And I say that with no disrespect to Rudy and William. But I think if I were to tell Rudy and William, you're winning Bristol Dirt, they're going to be like, I'm making the face again. (laughs) Let's get weird. Okay. Um, Like I said, I think it's going to be like, it's going to be someone completely out of nowhere um gosh uh hold on i'll be serious though i'm gonna pick stenhouse we talked about him earlier my honest to god gut feeling i feel stenhouse that, that's who i since like you brought him up that's he's kind of like stuck in my brain now um but screw it i'm just yeah i'll go stenhouse too um yeah stenhouse for the win um but i think i think bubba wallace finishes second Trying, trying to chase him down. Let's go with that. So, all right. So, any any uh, closing thoughts, Matt, on what's going to be a historic weekend of NASCAR, regardless of whether it's a good race or not? I'll say this, and I, I've said this a couple of times this year, but I want to be very adamant about it. Listen, I know I am a I am a sour sour pill when it comes to the intermediate package right now. So. But I'll, I will say this about the current state of NASCAR. I don't like the intermediate package, but I like short track racing. Mm-hmm. I even like road course racing. I even will have something that'll be very similar to a intermediate race with the low down force at Nashville super speedway where I'm getting at is no matter what version of NASCAR you like, whether it's high down force, low power, big power, short track, a dirt track, a road course this season has a little bit of something for everyone, whether you like certain elements or you don't like certain elements. I don't know if it's the best season ever. That was always hyperbolic and whatever. It's a high it's a high bar to clear. But I do give NASCAR a lot of credit for thinking outside the box or giving something for everyone and giving you a lot of flavors. Maybe you like pizza, maybe you like tacos, maybe you like whatever chili they're giving you something for everyone and i think that's kind of cool that we we can go from a super speedway to uh, a road course to an abrasive intermediate to a freshly paved intermediate to you know dirt now that's cool like so much variety and it's it's it's, it's a cool time to be a nascar fan for you crow it's a cool time to be a new nascar fan i think that's kind of awesome too yeah th- this is a uh, th- Oh, we were going to say something. Yeah, I was say I, I think, you know, so not entirely new, but coming back to it and like actually really committing to it now um, and you're watching every race, it definitely is the case. And it's a, like, there's a lot, it's, there's a lot of variety that is kind of why I stopped watching to begin with. Um, the other thing too, and that seems to be kind of unique to the season, is that there's more parity among the teams, which is you know makes things more unpredictable week to week. You know, it gives you a, you know, Michael McDowell winning Daytona 500. You know, it gives you a you know a chance to see people you wouldn't otherwise you know running farther up. So, yeah, I think it's been. It, it, I'm. I think this is a good season to get back into things. All right. Thanks, Crow. All right, so Matt, where can people find you for their, your coverage of this weekend's race? 
Yeah, it's, this is a auto week weekend, but I've got people all across the Carolinas and Virginias for short track scenes. I would encourage you guys, if you like short track racing, give the website a follow. Uh, Flow Racing, uh, I'm going to be handling sprint cars and midgets for them. Before we leave, I got one more message. I want to hit home very, very hard. And I know people are invested in this story right now. I want to end with this. Let Timmy race. Oh, <laughs> Stupid. This is an I racing free zone. I racing free zone, Matt. <laughs> no, listen, I, listen. I'm not the biggest fan of it either. But if you're going to do this and you're going to do this on TV, you got to let the guy who won the Texas race last year in. Stick <laughs> yeah. the charter up your ass. Yeah. Uh, okay. I I agree. For the record, I agree. But also, I hate I racing. <laughs> I hate, I hate the whole thing that they're doing. It's like it it was fine last year. We needed something last year. We it's did. no it's no longer April 2020. So that, that that's my thoughts on it. You know, right. I don't have you an opinion on I racing. Watch this. Say, say what? A million people are going to watch this. You know they are. They might. I mean, I'm going to watch it, but as soon as it's over, I'm going to stop caring. <laughs> so um, I don't care about it right now. I'm going to skip the hour and a half of pre-race or whatever Fox is doing, and just going to start it when they start the green flag. Oh, that's it. So anyway, <laughs> all right. This has been uh, the latest episode of Dropping the Hammer with Dan Lux Fadden. Thank you, Matt, for, for joining us. Um, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Don't, don't.